Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Planetarium live stream. I think we might have had a brief technical hiccup, but hopefully I am connected. Uh, and I would love to start by introducing myself. Uh, I am Patrick Hess, Planetarium Manager at Union Station. And tonight we'll be doing a star tour, looking at what's up in our spring night skies. Uh, and we'll also be taking a look at some highlights from the James Webb Space Telescope. So if you're a first time watcher, please stick around and uh, please feel free to comment in the comment section. This is a live stream if you're watching at 6 p.m. Central on March 4th, 2024. Uh, so let us know where, where you're watching from and let us know if you have any questions throughout the show. Uh, and if you're a returning watcher, welcome back. This is our 99th live stream. Uh, we have been running these since early 2020. Uh, in fact, um, here's a fun fact. I'm wearing a, a t-shirt from the uh, Eclipse in 2017, and there's been about one and a half times more time since I got this t-shirt, uh, between when I got this t-shirt and the first stream, uh, as there's been since the first stream and this 99th stream, so time really flies. Uh, and if you are a first time watcher, don't worry, all 98 of our other live streams are available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. So go over there and check out some curated playlists for some deep dive streams about all sorts of topics relating to astronomy and space. And once again, remember, if you're watching now, let me know. It's always a lot more fun when people are commenting and asking questions. And again, just give a shout out, let us know where you're watching from. It's always uh, fun to see that. Um, so this is our 99th live stream, and this will be our final Star Tour live stream. We'll be doing one more show to celebrate four years and 100 episodes, uh, but that will be a little bit more of a casual uh, retrospective where we're going to be looking at some highlights over the years. Uh, but tonight's stream, it's all down to business, uh, looking at a Star Tour, seeing what's up this spring. Um, by the way, this episode, and perhaps already, we should be hitting 350,000 uh, views on our live stream, which is streams, which is pretty incredible. And thank you to everybody who has continued to support uh, over the years, and to anybody who's just tuning in right now. Um, and uh, a couple of quick housekeeping notes to go over um, about what's going on around the planetarium at Union Station. We are heading into spring break here in about a week, where we're going to be bringing back some daytime laser shows, including everyone's favorite laser, Taylor Swift, with 13 of her favorite hits from over the years and eras. And then a brand new laser show is launching uh, starting uh, this coming Friday, and that is Laser Movie Magic. Uh, come and enjoy an enchanted spectacle of laser light set to some of your favorite uh, children's movies and uh, mouse-related themed uh, viewings uh, as I skirt, skirt around using other words to describe the show. But I think you can use the vague imagery of this poster to figure out what kind of movie magic you're experiencing at this show. Uh, oh, and speaking of which, don't forget, our Disney 100 exhibition is launching on May 24th this year. And tickets, I believe, are available for that. So head over to unionstation.org to get those tickets. And I'm already seeing people commenting in the comment section. We've got Andrew who's tuning in as uh, saying that they remember the eclipse in the river market. And Andrew's watching this stream from the river market too. Uh, I remember that as well. And uh, Andrew, I seem to remember uh, you may be coming in clutch with grabbing a 100 foot HDMI cord that day and saving our uh, show. So we really appreciate, uh, I really appreciate your support and I appreciate your support um, over all of these live streams, 100 episodes. That's got to be a lot of seconds, uh, more than one second. All right, and uh, my mom, Lauren, is watching from New Smyrna Beach. Uh, thanks for watching, Mom. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, and thanks to everybody who is still watching and commenting. Um, oh, a couple other fun announcements about um, the Planetarium. We've been doing some really special uh, artistic shows in the Planetarium lately. Um, last weekend, we showcased uh, a... Uh, a concert with some original compositions from around the Kansas City area. It was called Seasons and Cycles. You can see some photos there. It was a really awesome concert. We had uh, original electronic music uh, set uh, to um, awesome visuals on the dome and a live baritone saxophone uh, performance there as well. So that was a ton of fun. Uh, and our next art performance is uh, available now. Tickets are on sale March 16th in just a couple weeks. Laser Lou is showcasing his amazing show. Uh, and he'll be bringing some of his uh, lasers and prisms and mirrors. Uh, he does a lot of cool uh, live interactive laser art stuff. And then we have a cool show that we'll be projecting in the planetarium. So tickets are on sale for that now. Um, so be sure to check those out. Uh, and uh, also in the comments, we've got Sherry. Uh, is looking forward to Laser Lou. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one, Sherry. And I'm excited to have you there 
uh, with us. So keep the comments coming, everybody. But we're going to jump right into our star tour. So let's talk about what's up this spring. Now, our last show, I did a little bit of a preview for the whole year, um, but uh, we're going to be focusing on the spring of what we can expect here in the next few months. Jerry's in the comments. Thanks for watching, Jerry. Uh, one of our top fans saying hello. Appreciate you tuning in tonight. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show and let me know if you have any questions, of course. Um, so the highlight for this spring is definitely April 8th. Mark your calendars because the North American total solar eclipse is happening. The last time there was a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse that went across the continental United States like this was in 2017 from this t-shirt. Um, and so uh, this one is also going through Missouri. You can see it's going to be heading to uh, through the boot heel here. I think I've got a closer look at the local map. Um, so uh, that will be a pretty amazing thing. So uh, be sure to plan ahead. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of the hotels in that area are probably already booked. But the great thing about an eclipse is that if you just pull over on the side of the highway, you'll still be able to see it. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. I know I'll, I'm going to be trying to... Uh, view that uh, from up close. But again, if you're in this path, you'll be able to see the total solar eclipse. Everywhere else, including here in Kansas City, you'll be able to see a partial solar eclipse. So make sure if you are trying to observe this eclipse from outside of that band of totality, that you use proper eye protection. You can buy eclipse glasses pretty cheap online. We're selling them at the Science City store as well. So that is definitely a big highlight um, over the springtime. Uh, in the comments, we've got Eric, my dad, watching from Albuquerque. Hope your travels are going well, Dad. Thanks for watching tonight. Let me know if you have any questions. You always ask some great ones. Um, all right, continuing on our star tour for the springtime. Um, and let us see here. So uh, we're actually going to talk about some... Oh, actually, go back here. This this is showing us during the eclipse uh, the planets that you'll be able to see around the eclipse. So as the moon blocks out the sun, uh, you'll actually be able to see a few planets. Jupiter and Venus will be shining very brightly, and Saturn and Mars should just be visible as well. And then a comet, perhaps, you might be able to check out. Probably just with binoculars, though. Maybe not with the naked eye. Um, and then here are the paths of the next few uh, total solar eclipses crossing North America. Uh, and you're definitely not going to want to miss April 8th, April 8th's eclipse because the next eclipse that will be able to be seen from the contiguous United States will be on August 23rd, 2044, um, with another crossing from Pacific to Atlantic in 2045. So 44 and 45, mark your calendars. Uh, we'll see if, um, you know, maybe I'll do a live stream uh, if I'm still around and... Uh, you know, computers still exist by then. So mark your calendars for that. All right, so continuing on uh, with our um, our uh, planet visibility. Uh, so if we look at March and preview the springtime here, this is chart just basically just shows us um, when you can expect to find the planets in our evening sky. Um, now, the first five planets here, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, are the ones that are visible to the naked eye. Mercury is very tough to spot, though, because it's so close to the Sun. Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, though, pretty reliable. You can see those with the naked eye. So if you look at March here, we can see that, unfortunately, uh, Venus and Mars are all uh, visible in the early morning, at dawn and morning, respectively. Uh, Saturn, unfortunately, is out of sight now. It is behind the Sun, so it is not seen. Uh, and Jupiter is still visible. It'll be the brightest point of light you'll see in the early evening, and we'll take a look at that when we're looking at our star tour. Um, but Jupiter is going to be going out of sight here pretty soon. And for most of the summertime, actually, there aren't going to be a lot of planets visible in the evening. They'll all be clustered around our morning sky. So actually, in July, if you wake up early, you'll get quite a sight because you'll see a bunch of planets in the early morning. Uh, and then, come fall, we'll be getting some more planets, Saturn, appearing in our night sky around September. We've got Amber watching from the Albuquerque airport. Thanks for watching tonight, Amber. Uh, and Amber says the gate area is enjoying the show. All right, well, hey, everybody in Albuquerque. Hope you're enjoying the show tonight. Be sure to head over to uh, Union Station KC at, at uh, Facebook and like and subscribe to us there, as well as KC Planetarium on Facebook and YouTube and uh, subscribe there as well. We've got patients tuning in saying, hey, hey, right back at your patients. Let me know if you have any questions tonight. Uh, and I appreciate all the comments. It's always fun when people are on the other side of the screen. All right, actually, uh, let us pause for a moment. Uh, I'm going to save our web watch because what we need to do now is head over to Stellarium, our free bit of uh, planetarium software that you can download at home and explore for yourself. Uh, your planetarium um, uh, Patricks are uh, less than free, though. Well, I guess it's free tonight for the stream, but you'll have to get a ticket to see me at the planetarium. But for now, 
free software, free planetarium guy, and a free star tour that we are going to dive into here looking at out over the Kansas City skyline. We are on the steps of the Liberty Memorial here in downtown Kansas City, and we can see the sun starting to set in the west. Uh, if you've been following along the past few live streams, by the time our live stream started at 6 o'clock, it had already gotten dark, but as you can see, uh, it is 6 o'clock and the sun is still a little bit out, and a daylight savings time is coming up here in, I believe, about a week, and we're going to be springing forward, uh, which means that uh, the sun will be out for even longer in the evening. Uh, so um, you can expect uh, a little bit longer daytime. In fact, we're getting really close to the equinox when day and night is equal, and that's the first day of spring officially. That'll be towards the end of March, around the 21st or 22nd. Um, but here looking out over our Kansas City skyline, the sun is starting to set, but the sun uh, is a very close and bright star, and it's blocking our view of the other stars. So we're going to hit that fast forward button, and we are going to get that sun out of the way. So the sun will uh, cross below the horizon um, before night fully arrives. Uh, you've got to wait about an hour after sunset through the twilight hours when there's still a little bit of light refracting through our atmosphere. But you can see by around 6.45, the stars are starting to come out, and around 7 o'clock or 7.30, we're going to get a nice view of nighttime. And while we're waiting for that sun to finish setting, over in the comments, we've got Rusty watching from El Dorado Springs. Thanks for tuning in tonight, Rusty. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show, and definitely ask any questions. I know you always have a bunch of good ones. And here we go. So it's a little bit past 7 now, or we'll stop at about 7.20, when it is nighttime here in Kansas City. So looking out over our spring skies, there are a few views we can start to see. Starting over in the north, uh, we'll uh, start with the same few constellations that I usually start with for my star tours. They're always a good point of reference because even though you can always see these star patterns every season, depending on where they are and their orientations, um, that can kind of give you an idea of where other things are in our skies. So, for example, if we start with the dippers, our big spoon-shaped patterns, we can see that in the springtime, you'll find the Big Dipper over towards the east. Right over here, you see these seven bright stars forming this nice big spoon shape. And then, if we follow these two stars, the end of the Big Dipper's scoop across the sky points at this bright star here. And this is the star Polaris, which you may know as the North Star. And it's also the end of the handle of the Little Dipper, uh, another spoon shape made of seven a little bit dimmer stars, but still visible there. And so we can put uh, the lines up here. I always forget the, uh, oops, the keyboard shortcut. C, that's what it is. Um, so there is the uh, little dipper and the big dipper. Now, the dippers are technically not official constellations. Those in the know will already know that, obviously. They are unofficial patterns we call asterisms. And official constellations uh, are more recognized patterns and regions of our sky. Um, and so the constellations that use these same stars are not spoons, they're bears. The Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, uh, the Big Bear and the Little Bear. And we can see these patterns there. Uh, so, uh, names there, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, the Bears. We can see these in our northern sky every season, but in the springtime, you'll find Ursa Major starting to rise over in the east, sort of walking up into the sky over there. Uh, over in the comments, we've got uh, Midwest Drone Services, who says this is awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I hope you enjoy tonight's stream. So uh, our bear constellations here are a fun set of patterns. There are a lot of stories about them uh, throughout different mythologies. Um, but interestingly, most of the stories do involve bear figures here. So there's some common mythological uh, visions here. Most people saw these patterns as bear shapes. Um, there is a story from Roman mythology that I like to tell during my star tours, though. Uh, and it involves Jupiter, the king of the Roman gods, and the biggest planet, of course. Uh, now, the Romans believed Jupiter was the king of their gods. And in one of their stories, Jupiter fell in love one day with a mortal woman named Callisto. And when Jupiter's goddess wife Juno found out about this, she was very jealous, so she used her magic to turn beautiful Callisto into a bear, so that Callisto would no longer attract Jupiter. Later on, Callisto's son, named Arcus, was hunting in the forest when he came across his mother and almost accidentally shot her with his bow. At the last second, though, Jupiter stepped in and rescued them. Jupiter then turned Arcus into a bear as well. Then Jupiter grabbed both Arcus and his mother Callisto by their tails and threw them into the stars, 
so they'd be safe together forever. And being the king of the gods, Jupiter was so strong that as he threw them into the sky, their tails stretched out. And that's why the bears have long tails in the stars, unlike real bears that have short tails. Now that star there, the North Star, uh, is a very famous and important star, Polaris. It's called Polaris because it, it lies directly above the North Pole. And as the Earth rotates around its North Axis, which is the North Pole, Polaris will always remain stationary. So if we fast forward time again as the night goes on, we'll see that the stars will be moving around, but Polaris will stay stationary, and that's why it's such a useful tool for navigation at nighttime. And that's why it is called the North Star. No matter what time it is, no matter where you are, if you can find that North Star, you can always find North, because it always points North. We've got Holly in the comments saying hi, as well as Connor. Thanks for watching tonight, both of you. All right, so moving on with our spring star tour, uh, I'm going to go ahead and rotate here to the west. There are a few interesting sights that are setting the season that will be out of sight pretty soon. Uh, the thing about the spring night sky is that it will change more quickly than the fall night sky, um, which may not make a whole lot of sense. It's kind of hard to explain, but essentially, as we approach fall, the sun is starting to set earlier and earlier, and so the sky sort of doesn't change as much, but in the springtime, the sun is setting uh, later and later, and so the sky will actually be changing, or appear to change more quickly night to night. So these views are going to be out of sight pretty soon, so you'll definitely not want to miss them. And looking over in the west, we can see uh, a star pattern here that is part of a story that I don't necessarily have time to tell right now, but you can kind of imagine the star pattern looking like an upside down banana peel uh, right around here. Uh, this is the constellation Andromeda. Uh, but the interesting thing about Andromeda is a deep space object that lies in this constellation. It's a hazy patch of light that's going to be really hard to see, but is sometimes visible with the naked eye if you get far enough away from the city lights. Uh, and that little patch of light is the Andromeda Galaxy. So the Andromeda Galaxy is our galaxy, the Milky Way's sister galaxy. It's the closest spiral galaxy to us, and it's twice as big as the Milky Way. In fact, it's hard to see here, but it's actually about six times as wide as the Moon's angular diameter. So if the Moon was right next to the Andromeda Galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy would be six times as wide. That's how big it is, and that's how close it is. And it's actually moving towards us at a pretty fast rate, and in about four billion years, our two galaxies will collide with one another. But in the meantime, it is one of the few deep space objects that is visible to the naked eye, and through a telescope, you can see this hazy patch of light there. So that is starting to set in the springtime. And another thing you'll see this season is a very bright point of light over in the west. It's so bright, you'll even see it before the sun finishes setting. And it may be hard to see, but here in our software and in the real night sky, you'll notice that the stars around this point of light are twinkling. You can see them lightly flicker there. I think they twinkle even more in the stream, which is a good thing. But this point of light that I'm pointing out is not twinkling. Now, the reason stars twinkle is because stars are very far away from Earth. And by the time distant stars' light reaches our planet, only a tiny speck of that light is actually able to pass through the Earth's atmosphere. And our atmosphere, all those gases above our head, cause that light to sort of bounce around as it comes in. And that's what causes stars to twinkle. Now this object here is a lot closer than stars, so more of its light is able to pass through the Earth's atmosphere undisturbed, so it will not twinkle. And that is the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is the uh, one planet that's visible in the early evening tonight. Like I said, it's so bright, you'll even see it in the uh, sky before the sun finishes setting. In fact, if you've got a view of the western sky right now, now look out there and if you can see a bright point of light, that is Jupiter. Now, we explore Jupiter in more depth during our live star tour at the Planetarium, so if you haven't visited us yet there, please do. But I do want to point out some interesting things around Jupiter here, and that's these four bright points of light. Now, these four points of light are actually moons of Jupiter. Jupiter in total has 95 confirmed moons, but most of them are so small they are not visible. These moons, however, are so big and so reflective that they're visible even through a pair of decent binoculars. Um... And these moons uh, are nicknamed the Galilean moons. Um, now, they are called the Galilean moons because Galileo Galilei observed these moons through his early telescope hundreds of years ago. And as he observed them over the course of nights and uh, 
uh, weeks, he noticed something, and I'm gonna try to do something here. Uh, let me see if I can do it without messing things up too much. So what I wanna do is I want to hide the atmosphere and the ground, and I focused on Jupiter, and now I'm going to fast forward. So what you're gonna see here, it's gonna kind of rotate around, so I hope nobody gets motion sickness, but um, oops, let's focus on Jupiter. There we go. So what you're seeing here is these moons are going to be darting back and forth, sort of, sort of to the left and right of Jupiter. So you can see this one just moved to that side, and then, woo, oh, and I've lost it. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's return to now, zoom back out here, okay. So what Galileo observed through his telescope is he observed these moons moving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and I actually have um, an image of his hand drawings that he did there. So he drew these moons over the course of um, d uh, days and weeks, and he observed them moving back and forth. And this is one of the first clues that led Galileo to his conclusion that the Earth was going around the Sun and not the Sun going around the Earth as it was conventionally believed around then. Um, so this, these early findings, um, sort of blew apart our understandings of the universe uh, and led to uh, our a new perspective on the solar system, which was heliocentrism, where this uh, sun was the center of our solar system and not the Earth. So if you do have a pair of binoculars at home, um, you can see those Galilean moons. And uh, let me fast forward back to nighttime here. And as I said earlier, Jupiter will be out of sight pretty soon, so be sure to check that out. Another constellation that's going to be out of sight soon is going to be Orion the Hunter, one of my favorite constellations, a very prominent winter constellation. Of course, Orion's famous belt here is outlined by these four stars. And then below Orion's belt are three dimmer stars that form his dagger or sword hilt. But if you do have access to a telescope, you can see this deep space object hiding inside of Orion called the Orion Nebula. It's a star forming region that we dive in depth into our uh, during our star tour uh, at the planetarium. So I'd encourage you to come check that out if you want to learn more about the life and evolution of stars. As we continue moving on, I'm going to be focusing on what's starting to rise in the east as spring approaches. Uh, but I'm going to take a brief pause because we got some comments over here. We've got Jerry who's enjoying the stream again and saying that it's very interesting. I'm um, glad you're still having fun, Jerry. Thanks again for watching. Cindy's watching and says, cool. Not as cool as you, Cindy. We've got Holly saying we're watching from Northwest Missouri. Awesome. Thanks for watching tonight, Holly. And I've got Emily watching from our kitchen. Love you, Emily. That's my fiance. And we've got Rhonda who says, hello, Patrick from Lenexa, and hello, Phoebe. Oh, somebody who's hoping for a Phoebe cameo. I think we could probably make that happen at some point during the stream, maybe towards the end. Uh, and uh, Robin is asking, is the surface of our sun changing, appearing different? That's a great question, Rhonda. Thanks for asking that. Um, so the question is, our sun's surface changing? Uh, the answer is yes. So our sun actually goes through seasons in a way. Um, its seasons and cycles are a bit uh, different um, than ours. Uh, basically, the sun's surface goes through periods of about 12 years where it gets really active and really inactive. Um, so uh, I'm not sure where we are in that cycle right now, but it, the sun's atmosphere will go through these periods. And when the sun's atmosphere is really inactive, then um, when we observe it, it looks mostly uh, smooth, basically. There aren't any features on it, but when the sun's surface is really active, we'll see a lot of sunspots on it. I'm trying to pull up some uh, pictures here of uh, some examples of uh, different seasons on the sun. Let's see. Let's see here. Ah, quick. Oh, no, this is pretty good, actually. And it's NASA. We trust NASA, mostly. All right. Uh, so here is... Uh, oh, there we go. So Solar Cycle 25 just started a few years ago. Um, so I think, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, around 2020, um, that was when the sun's activity had dipped, and so now the sun is becoming more active. Because I remember um, uh, 
way earlier in the last decade, I was doing a lot of telescopes op observations of the sun, seeing a lot more sunspots, but lately there have been fewer. Uh, but you can see here in this uh, different wavelength of light um, that we can see uh, when the sun's uh, in an inactive season, uh, there aren't a lot of uh, sunspots or what we call coronal mass ejections on its surface. Um, but then when it is really active, you get all these activities. You get solar flares and all these things that don't really affect us here on Earth. Um, but um, you can see there is quite a difference. And again, it's about 11 and a half years that the sun uh, goes through that cycle. Oh, here's another cool graphic. Let's see if I, I can pull this up. It's from weather.com. Um, uh, there you go. Yeah, so uh, 2020, the sun was kind of at the tail end of its uh, cycle of activity, um, but it is going to start getting more active as we kind of continue around there. Uh, so that was a really great question. Uh, uh, thank you so much for asking that, Rhonda. Appreciate you. Um, uh, Jerry saying, I need to get back to the planetarium. Yeah, you do, Jerry. Be sure to do that. And be sure to let me know when you're heading there so I can make sure I say hi, too. It's always fun to see our viewers when they uh, show up in person at the Dome. All right, back to our star tour. Let's see what is rising in the east this season. And I do love our Liberty Memorial here, but it is pretty big. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up a little bit of a flatter landscape here. Now, the first constellation that kind of signals the arrival of springtime is Leo the Lion. You can spot Leo by looking for this backwards question mark shape. Um, that is the lion's head and mane. Here's the lion's body and tail. Leo represents the Nemean lion. This was the ferocious beast that Hercules fought and defeated during the first of his 12 labors. Oops. Apologies for that. Uh, the brightest star in Leo is named Regulus, which means little king. Regulus is also sometimes associated with the Star of Bethlehem, which we dive in depth into during the holiday season during our Stars of Faith planetarium show. Then this star at the end of its tail is called Denebola, which means Tail of the Lion in Arabic. Now Denebola is the first star of a special star pattern that signifies the arrival of spring. It's called the Spring Triangle. So if we fast forward time a little bit later, it's 8 o'clock right now, but if we stay up even later, we'll see some stars that will be coming out later tonight, but also will be coming out earlier as the season progresses. And we're going to be looking for another bright star here, this one. Right there, this is the star Arcturus, which is part of a constellation that looks a little bit like an ice cream cone. Uh, or maybe I'm just hungry. Uh, this constellation's name is Buotes. He's a bit of a lesser known constellation. Um, but it is one of the oldest constellations in our night sky. References to it have been discovered dating back to ancient Mesopotamian, or ancient uh, Sumerian texts, rather. Um, so that is Arcturus. Arcturus is the second brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere. And then a little bit later, arising at around 10 o'clock, is this bluish star down here. Uh, this star is the hand of a, a big stick figure constellation, which we'll have to stay up another hour to see in its entirety. So here's one hand, her arm and other arm, her head is up here, here's her torso, and then her legs kind of go down here. Her name is Virgo, Virgo the Maiden. Virgo op often represents a uh, goddess of fertility and harvest. The Greeks called her Demeter, the Romans called her Ceres. Now she's often depicted in art as holding an ear of grain in one hand, signifying the arrival of the uh, growing season. And that star in her hand, the star I pointed out, is named Spica, which means ear of grain in Latin. So those three stars, Denebola, the end of Leo's tail, Arcturus, part of Buotes, and Spica in Virgo, those form a nearly perfect equilateral triangle that as soon as it has risen after sunset, you can tell spring arrives. Now this star pattern is one of a few different star patterns like this. There's a summer triangle, for example. And again, the way this works is that as you start to see these stars rising earlier and earlier in the evening, you can tell spring is approaching. But on the night where you can see all three stars already up after sunset, that tells you spring is here. Um, but by the way, these two stars, Arcturus and Spica, have a fun little limerick you can use to remember their names by. Over here, we can see the Big Dipper again, a little bit higher in the sky as spring is continuing. Now, if we see the Big Dipper's handle, it's shaped like an arc. Now imagine us extending that arc across the sky. You can see that arc will kind of pass through these two stars. And to help you remember this, there is a little saying that goes along with it. Just remember, arc to Arcturus, 
and speed on to Spica, and you can easily find and remember these two stars. Again, just arc to Arcturus, and speed on to Spica. And that's our little preview of our spring stars. All right, back in the comment section, we've got Julie, who says, thank you so much for such a wonder, uh, for such wonderful informational sessions. They will be missed. Uh, I know, Julie, and I'm going to miss doing them too. Uh, but this is, uh, it has been an incredible run for four years. This is our 99th live stream. And we, were, we will do one more grand finale live stream where we'll be taking a retrospective on everything we've done for all of these Star Tours. So mark your calendars. Uh, we are planning on hosting that a month from now on April 1st, not April Fools, uh, but uh, it will be that night for our 100th live stream. Uh, and thank you, Julie, and to all of our watchers for all of your support over the many years. Uh, it's pretty incredible. I've been doing these live streams for uh, over a third of my time working at Union Station, which is kind of mind-blowing uh, and really brings out the gray in my beard. <laughs> Vanessa also in the comments is saying hello. Thanks for watching tonight, Vanessa. I hope you're enjoying tonight's show. And I hope everyone enjoys our next segment of the show, which is Web Watch. Now, we've been do covering the James Webb Space Telescope for many years, uh, going all the way back uh, to the James Webb uh, Space Telescope's uh, launch on Christmas Day 2021, all the way to its uh, deployment, through its deployment, and its first images revealed in July of 2022. Uh, and then we did a retrospective looking over the, its first year of uh, science discoveries. But I wanted to do one final web watch for this stream. And this will be the last segment of tonight's show um, where we are going to just go over, again, some of my highlights from over uh, the past year and a half of web's exploration. And then I'm going to highlight some upcoming missions for the web telescope. So keep the questions coming, everybody. Um, and uh, let's... Uh, Continue on. Oh, Vanessa's asking, why are you ending the shows? Uh, well, Vanessa, we are approaching 100 episodes and our fourth anniversary. Uh, and we started out doing these shows three times a week during uh, the pandemic lockdowns. Uh, then uh, after things were starting to open up, we transitioned to weekly shows, followed by monthly shows. Uh, and it's time to uh, continue and moving on to bigger and better things. And so the Planetarium and myself have a lot of exciting events uh, that we're planning for uh, a, at the planetarium some live uh, events and a lot of really cool and creative art and musical projects in the planetarium and to help me focus my time on those projects um, we're going to be phasing out our regular streams uh you know never say never if there's a special event and an exciting mission we'll definitely be covering that so it probably will, won't be the final few times you'll see me this month and next month um, but for our monthly streams it's time to uh, kind of move on to bigger and better things. Um, but I, of course, have appreciated everyone's support. And you know what they say, it's always better to leave when you'll be missed than to be kicked out the door. Uh, Jerry says, break out the champagne for the 100th episode. Uh, we'll break something out, Jerry, for sure. It's quite a journey we have taken. Uh, and uh, I think I may have, may have mentioned it before, but 350,000 views is pretty incredible. Okay, so let's jump in to Web Watch. Uh, and uh, actually kind of fitting for today, um, uh, just about two years ago this month, uh, we received our first photons from the Webb Telescope. Uh, scientists were uh, hard at work aligning the mirrors of the telescope. We wouldn't get its official uh, color images until July, but the first pictures and the first selfie uh, were revealed. Here's that selfie from Webb. Now these pictures are in black and white and they're a bit fuzzy and weird uh, and that is basically because once they deployed the telescope they sort of took a very basic picture of where all the mirrors were. All these points of light here were one star and so they spent the course of weeks and months moving all of the mirrors so that all those points of light would align into one place right in the center of the telescope because essentially what the Webb telescope is is 18 separate telescopes that are all combined to form one um, amazing image. So two years ago today was, or uh, this month was when that was happening. But uh, back in July of 2022, the first uh, color images were revealed. Um, and those are available here in this uh, gallery, which opened in a new window. There we go. So uh, to celebrate the first images on July 12th, 2022, they released five images actually. And we're just gonna kind of have a retrospective to go over some of those because they are some of the prettiest pictures that Webb has released. 
there was the Carina Nebula here, which was uh, breathtaking. And this uh, extremely detailed and super zoomed in view. I can zoom in even more here. Whoa, here's your thumbnail picture. <laughs> so the Carina Nebula uh, almost looks like a landscape of mountains and valleys speckled, speckled with glittering stars. Uh, and it's actually the edge of a nearby young star forming region, a nebula uh, called uh, NGC 3324. Um, now this whole uh, mass of clouds is located about 7,600 light years away from us. Uh, and um, one of these images shows a comparison between Webb and Hubble, our most recent, uh, our previous uh, high-tech telescope uh, that was launched in the 90s. And you can see quite a bit more detail um, and especially looking at these clouds, Webb's infrared imagery is able to pierce through these clouds and actually see the stars hiding within them. So some pretty amazing stuff. And, uh, you know, everybody's desktop background for at least a few months after that happened. Uh, Vanessa in the comments is asking, are you going to live stream the solar eclipse? Uh, Vanessa, uh, we are going to definitely have something on our uh, Facebook page. And again, if you're watching on the Union Station Facebook page, after the stream is done, be sure to head over to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page. Like and subscribe to us there because we'll be posting a bunch of content leading up to the solar eclipse. Uh, it is a Monday that will be closed, so we won't have any events at Union Station. Plus, like I pointed out before, you won't be able to see the eclipse from Union Station, at least not in its totality. So we're encouraging people, if they are able, to try to get into that path of totality so they don't miss that once-in-a-lifetime experience. But for those who don't, who aren't able to make it, um, we will provide some sort of live stream. Uh, NASA will be doing streams that will be much better than anything we can uh, do ourselves. So we'll be probably probably posting links to that. So Vanessa, be sure you're subscribed to our Facebook page, excuse me, for uh, all of that. So moving on, another one of the first images released from Webb was Stepin's Quintet. And uh, the uh, classic Christmas movie fans may recognize uh, this as actually a uh, the, the exact same group of galaxies that was featured in It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, these represented uh, the various angels that were talking to Clarence. Um, and it is, uh, if you go back and watch that, it's actually just this picture, uh, albeit in 1950s form. Um, but uh, Stefan's Quintet, uh, it was revealed in much greater detail back in July of 2022. Uh, as one of the first of the five images um, revealed by Webb. So it's called a quintet, uh, and there are five galaxies featured in this picture, although four of them are actually close together. Uh, the, this leftmost galaxy here is actually uh, quite a bit closer, uh, over 200 million light years closer than the other four galaxies. Uh, but um, this uh, was still an amazing picture in this enormous mosaic uh, covered about one fifth of the moon's angular diameter. That's how zoomed in we are. Uh, and information from Webb studying these galaxies uh, provides new insights into how galactic interactions woo, may have driven galaxy evolution in the early universe. You can see how zoomy these pictures are. Uh, and just something to point out, all of these uh, dots with these diffraction spikes here, these uh, spiky things, those are stars that are in our own galaxy closer to us. And then every point of light farther on these are galaxies way beyond our galaxy. So all of these are groups of stars containing over billions of stars. Uh, just in one photo, there are probably thousands of galaxies. Pretty incredible. Checking back in the comments, we've got Tammy, one of our top fans as well. Great to see you tonight, Tammy. Saying, hi, Patrick. I'm so sorry to be late, especially this one. No worries, Tammy. We do post recordings of all of these on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash kcplanetarium. Go ahead and smash that subscribe button if you can after this show. Uh, but Tammy, no worries. Glad to see you here. And we've got one more live stream after this, so don't worry. Andrew in the comments says, do you know if AI was used to enhance these web photos or are these straight out of the telescope? That is a really amazing question, Andrew. Um, so uh, the answer is no for now. They're not using AI, um, not in the image processing, I should say. Uh, so. The way they process these images, and I'm going to try to find a good graphic. Ah, perfect. Thank you, European Space Agency. Um, so uh, here is some information about how they process the images. But um, the Webb telescope and pretty much every space telescope doesn't have a, a camera like you would really imagine. Um, or uh, They don't function like cameras here on Earth. Uh, they're usually sensors that uh, just actually detect 
um, very basic wavelengths of light, often just a single wavelength at a time. So not sort of red, green, blue colors that you might imagine. What they do is they use filters to capture uh, to filter out different wavelengths, whether they're visible light or infrared light. And so the raw images that actually come from web look a little bit more like this. Um, and so through careful processing, uh, that involves um, some computations. Um, I wouldn't say AI, but they probably use a little bit of, um, you know, I don't even know if they're into machine learning yet for a lot of this processing because in order to preserve the science, they want to keep things as unprocessed as possible. So what we see often with our sort of beautiful color images, um, those aren't really what scientists use. Those are really just for the general public and all of these colors, especially in images from web, that's not what this galaxy would look like if we were actually, you know, floating in front of it uh, because this is color adapted to uh, our visible light spectrum of a photograph taken in an infrared light spectrum. So Webb is taking photos mostly in infrared wavelengths, but we want to look at those photos. And so they'll shift those colors and they'll take those different filtered images and they'll stack them on top of each other and they'll choose different colors to represent different things. So for example, oftentimes these red areas will be star forming regions. So there'll be nebulas um, where uh, we can detect heat, where those infrared signals are telling scientists that that's where stars are being born. Um, Whereas blue may be lanes of gas and dust that are reflecting light from older stars. Um, and then, you know, the raw data itself, the actual sort of ones and zeros from the pixels, that's what the real astronauts or astronauts, real astrophysicists are interested in studying. Because at the end of the day, what they're interested in is a big Excel, Excel spreadsheet of a bunch of these numbers that uh, sort of reveal these things. So uh, that's a really great question, uh, Andrew. I'm glad you asked. And, um, uh, I can't Google and uh, talk at the same time. Uh, you know, there are some um, amateur astronomers that are starting to do that. But in general, for astrophotography, they try to keep things as quote unquote dumb as possible to preserve the image uh, as best they can. Um, there's another technique called stacking, where you actually take a video feed from, a, say, a telescope, and then uh, you'll use uh, algorithms to filter out, you know, movement and, um, you know, grain and, uh, uh, noise and things like that. Uh, but the farthest we get, I think, right now are algorithms because um, using AI in that way uh, for image processing, you can lose some of that scientific data. But that's a really good question. Now, uh, Rusty is asking, how much longer will the Hubble Space Telescope be used? That's a great question, Rusty. Um, and so I'll just kind of jump ahead uh, to talking about uh, Webb and its future. So uh, Webb's mission, its original mission was designed for uh, a five-year mission, which might seem crazy for a $10 billion telescope, but you always uh, aim low and then be uh, excited when things go better. The goal for Webb was 10 years, but Webb's launch was so successful and they actually were so efficient with its fuel use that um, scientists estimate we'll be able to keep Webb in its proper location in space for up to 20 years. By contrast, the Hubble Space Telescope's mission was planned for 15 years, uh, but now over 30 years after its deployment, we're still using the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope for some amazing science. So who knows? Uh, Webb is a bit different than Hubble, though. Hubble is orbiting the Earth, uh, so it is in a bit more of a stable position. Uh, it's going to continue in its uh, place for decades and decades. Webb, on the other hand, is sort of balanced out in sort of a gravitational uh, sort of eddy where it actually needs to continually adjust itself and move to stay where it needs to be. So once Webb runs out of fuel, unfortunately its primary mission will no longer be able to continue because it will be out of that sweet spot without a way to get back into it. Um, so honestly, there's a great chance that we may be uh, using Hubble for longer than Webb, but Webb had to be in its position to get the kind of science we want. So the amount of science we're going to get from Webb in its short lifespan will be incredible and definitely worth it. So great question, Rusty. All right, so uh, Andrew says, that's so interesting. I didn't realize these would look differently in space. Thanks for the thorough answer. Absolutely, thanks for the great question. Uh, I should have expected an AI question from you, um, but that's a good one. And honestly, it makes me want to do research because I'm sure there are uh, astronomers who are looking into that. I'm guessing what they'll end up using AI for though is um, for doing things like adaptive optics. So adaptive optics are uh, using um, measurements uh, of the Earth's atmospheric distortion to sort of subtract that distortion from ground-based telescopes. Uh, so essentially, the, that twinkling we see in the stars, 
if we're able to sort of wobble the optics in a way that kind of cancels out the twinkling, um, you can actually get really amazing ground-based observations without that atmospheric distortion. And so I could see uh, machine learning being used to uh, do some of those calculations on the fly a lot more quickly than some of our older, slower algorithms. So I'm, I bet you there are people looking into that. Um, but as with everything, you want to balance the science with, um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, I, the, the hard data, I guess, with uh, AI. But you know, there's, there's a place to blend those together for sure. All right. So some of the other highlights uh, from Webb's early times. We got some really cool data from, and we got another cool uh, picture of a ring nebula, uh, or planetary nebula rather. This is uh, the remnants of a star's death. And this is another illustration of how cool Webb is because Webb's instruments are able to peer through the clouds and actually see a second star that we couldn't see before. So we photographed this nebula with Hubble um, and those images are elsewhere, but using Webb, we can actually look through the clouds to see that there are two stars in this nebula. And by observing these stars, which are actually orbiting each other, we can learn a lot about how their gravitational influence affects the shapes of these nebulas as they continue to grow. Uh, we got some really cool data from Webb right off the bat. Um, for example, this is data from the atmosphere of an exoplanet. Uh, this is a gas giant about 1,100 light years away from Earth. It orbits its parent star about every three and a half days, uh, so it's very close to that star. Now, uh, the Webb telescope cannot actually take close-up pictures of these planets because they're so far away and so tiny, but it can observe transits when these planets move in front of their parent stars. And when that happens, Webb can measure the light coming from that star, and it can measure the difference in light as the planet passes in front of it. Now, planets with atmosphere will refract that light, just like our atmosphere causes light from the stars to wobble and twinkle. Light from the parent stars of these exoplanets will pass through the atmospheres of the planets. And when we see that light passing through the atmosphere, we can observe the changes in wavelengths and we can actually learn what those atmospheres are made out of. So this specific planet was chosen. We knew it was an exoplanet and we thought it had an atmosphere. But thanks to these early observations, again, these were the first observations released from the Webb telescope. We actually were able to see water vapor in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. That's right, we detected water in a planet far away from us. Now, I should say, this water is a little bit more like steam because this planet is so close to its sun, it's very hot. So there's no liquid oceans on this planet, most likely, and almost certainly no life. But the fact that on its first day, Webb found water on a distant planet a thousand light years away, is pretty incredible and just gives you an idea of the amazing discoveries it might make in the future. There are currently over 5,000 confirmed discovered exoplanets to date, with 10,000 candidates in the works as they're testing them and trying to figure out if they are exoplanets. Um, and uh, of these exoplanets, 450 confirmed exoplanets are within 100 light years from Earth. 200 of these exoplanets have host stars visible to the naked eye. And there is an exoplanet four light years away uh, around our nearest star system neighbor. So um, pretty incredible stuff and I'm sure we're going to make some amazing exoplanet discoveries thanks to Webb in the future. And the last bit of data collected by Webb was this amazing deep field. We called it Webb's first deep field. Uh, a deep field image is basically when we point a telescope, we zoom it in as far as possible, and we find a spot in the sky that is pitch black. And then we leave that telescope, um, we leave the shutter open basically on that camera for hours and hours, uh, and then we can see the unseen. And so that's what we see here. And this is this deep space photograph has a few stars in it. Again, every dot that has this six-sided cross pattern is a star, but every other object in this picture is a galaxy, even the tiniest little dots and specks farther away. And uh, oh, there we go, there we go. Yep, all those distant dots, those are galaxies with billions of stars. So this image is approximately the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length, a tiny sliver of our vast universe. Uh, and in this, uh, in this image, we're also looking way back in time. We're looking at this galaxy cluster as it appeared about four and a half billion years ago. That's how far away it is. Uh, and we can also see some gravitational lensing. So these sort of ring-shaped distortions you'll see are, are actually, that's actually light from galaxies that's bent by gravity. 
So pretty incredible stuff. Ooh. And every time I put my water bottle down, it knocks my <laughs> camera shutter off. Ooh. All right. So, <laughs> you know, I was saying earlier today that this would be a shorter live stream, but it's already been 50 minutes. So I'm going to try to shoot through some other highlights, some other cool things that I wanted to share from Webb's, uh, Webb's time. And uh, here, I'll check this out. Uh, now, Webb also was looking at our own solar system, so we've taken some, taken some amazing pictures of our solar system. Again, Webb's primary images are uh, infrared, so we see some really interesting views of the planets. For example, this is Jupiter. Not just Jupiter, but we can see Jupiter's rings. That's right, Jupiter does have a faint, dusty ring system. <coughs> and then uh, the northern and southern hemisphere, or sorry, northern and southern poles of Jupiter, we can see aurora so that's right jupiter has northern and southern lights uh, and we can see those in webb's images Webb also took some pictures of neptune and uh, i don't want to log into Flickr. no thank you uh let's do that again there we go um so uh this you can see uh the voyager probe actually passed by neptune it got some pretty big picture pretty good pictures close up hubble on the other hand is here on earth so its pictures are a bit fuzzy and then Webb got um, a bit of a clearer picture than Hubble, but again, with this infrared imagery, um, we can see it's pretty incredible stuff. Again, uh, Saturn's not the only planet with rings. Neptune has a dusty set of rings as well, which we can see here. It almost looks like a pearl. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. Here's another highlight I wanted to share. And this is a great example. Rusty was asking earlier about Hubble. Well, we actually are using both Hubble and Webb together to get some great science. And so we're looking at multiple wavelengths of one galaxy here. This is the Phantom Galaxy, M74. And this showcases how powerful um, we can, uh, how, how powerful uh, multiple space observatories are working together. So on the left is the Hubble Space Telescope's view of this galaxy. Uh, and we can see older, redder stars towards the center. Um, and uh, these, these star-forming regions, these red globs farther out. And then younger, bluer stars in its spiral arms. Uh, and combining the infrared imagery, we can peer through the clouds to see the star-forming regions in even greater detail. So pretty beautiful stuff. Now, Webb is also setting its sights on some other familiar sites. For example, the Pillars of Creation, one of the most famous scientific uh, or astro astronomical photographs ever taken, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope a few times. The most recent was in 2014. But of course, we wanted to view this same feature with Webb and with its infrared imagery. We can peer through those clouds to see the baby stars being born inside that star-forming region. Um, so the reason we want to go back and look at images we've already taken a picture of is um, Webb helps us to identify far more precise counts of newborn stars, along with quantities of gas and dust. And this uh, deepens our understanding of how stars form. Uh, and uh, also just, I mean, amazing pictures, right? You know, listen to Jerry. Jerry says, so incredible. It is so incredible. So those were all highlights from 2022. But... Uh, 2023, uh, moving into its uh, second year, um, the Webb Telescope celebrated uh, its first anniversary with um, the Rho Ophiuchi Cloud Complex photograph. Uh, and this is one we've highlighted before, but this is the closest star forming region to Earth. A pretty incredible and beautiful photograph. Um, and uh, I actually have um, a comparison picture where you can see what our last clearest uh, image versus webs and you can see that it's quite a jump in quality so this star forming region is about 390 light years away from earth um, and uh, using webs amazing uh, technology we were able to see 50 young stars all of them similar in mass to the sun and there are even some protoplanetary systems in this forming region so solar systems on their way to being born uh, here's another cool picture uh, from last year that Webb revealed. Uh, and this is a photograph of the star uh, Arendelle, which I believe is named after something from uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, but Arendelle is the farthest star ever detected. It existed in the first billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope 
uh, shows it to be a massive B-type so star, more than twice as hot as our sun and about a million times more bright. Um, and it's only detectable thanks to its alignment with the galaxy cluster between Arendelle and us, and gravitational lensing causes the light from this distant star to bend around and allows us to see it, and magnifying it kind of like a lens as well. And so um, the star is about 4,000 times uh, bigger thanks to this gravitational lensing and magnification, which is how we're able to see it. And based on the colors of light, Coming from Arendelle, astronomers think that it may have a cooler companion star, even. Also, uh, some pretty amazing announcements were revealed about Webb. Uh, uh, Webb's primary mission is to look back in time, to look very far away into the edges of our visible uh, universe, where we can see the beginnings of our universe. And Webb is, is trying to learn about the stars and galaxies that existed at the beginning of our universe, right after the Big Bang. And Webb has spotted some really old galaxies. Uh, some galaxies, uh, the early, the oldest galaxy, I believe, existed about 350 a million years after the Big Bang, which is pretty incredible. That's 13 billion years ago. So again, 350 million years after the Big Bang. Um, now, these galaxies, though, identified by Webb, um, are uh, a little bit older, so they... Uh, uh, existed about 500 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. But the weird thing about these galaxies is that they are very massive, so massive that they really shouldn't exist. So based on our current understandings about the origins of our universe, um, galaxies shouldn't have been, been this big at this point in the history of our universe. So by making these discoveries, Webb is challenging our understandings about what the Big Bang even was, and perhaps our universe is older than we thought it was, or maybe the beginning of our universe is a bit different than we thought too. Another highlight from Webb is the first ever photograph of a asteroid belt in a distant solar system. Uh, there are three nested belts in this system. Uh, that is, um, these uh, these belts of asteroids are about 150 times the distance of the Earth to the Sun. So this is very big, um, but pretty cool that we are able to see asteroid belts in distant uh, star systems. And then here's a fun one. Uh, Webb has been... Uh, asking a lot of questions. Right, well, Webb has not only been answering questions uh, about our universe, it's also been uh, asking questions. Get it? Asking questions. <laughs> this is a real uh, real feature inside one of the photographs uh, taken by Webb. And these are galaxies. Um, this question mark shaped object, it's probably a pair of galaxies uh, that are in the process of merging. As the galaxies approach and interact, the shape uh, can be distorted uh, and including pieces being ripped off. And so, uh, yeah, question mark in space. There you go. That might be my thumbnail. That was pretty good, right? Webb is answering questions and asking them too. So, uh, and the last little thing that I wanted to feature uh, recently is that Webb also uh, captured one of the most colorful our, the most colorful view of our universe yet. And this is another collaboration with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a study of a galaxy cluster known as uh, MAX 0416. Uh, this is a, pan a panchromatic image that combines visible and infrared light to assemble one of the most comprehensive views of the universe ever obtained. So most colorful in that there are the widest range of wavelengths in one single image. Um, and uh, this... Uh, uh, galaxy cluster is about four and a half billion light years from Earth, uh, and it's a pair of colliding clusters that will eventually combine to form an even bigger cluster. And this image reveals a wealth of details, um, ooh, such as that one, I guess, um, <laughs> that uh, are only made possible by combining the power of these um, two telescopes. So you can see the two separate images, and then the combined image there. So um, we can see in this uh, photograph the boundary of galaxies outside the cluster and a sprinkling of sources that vary over time, likely due to gravitational lensing. So again, you can see a lot of these stretched and curved um, shapes there are more evidence of gravitational lensing. These colors all give clues uh, to uh, the composition of these uh, galaxies and their distances, uh, so how far away they are from each other. The bluest galaxies are relatively nearby and often show intense star formation 
as best detected by Hubble, while the redder galaxies tend to be more distant and are best detected by Webb. Some galaxies also appear very red because they contain copious amounts of cosmic dust that tend to observe bluer colors of starlight. Uh, so what about the future? And we are going to be starting to wrap up tonight's stream. So last uh, minute comments and questions, be sure to throw those in now. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of the James Webb Space Telescope. Where do we go from here? Well, its mission definitely continues. And in fact, just days ago, uh, last Thursday, in fact, on Leap Day, the Space Telescope Science Institute announced their cycle three of web observations. So this is the third year, basically, of web observations. Um, the proposals that were accepted uh, and will be sort of queued up for observations. Uh, the way these space telescopes work is that, um, of course, we want as many scientists using this equipment as possible. Um, and so there's a process of submitting applications for uh, studies and uh, time of use for the telescope. Uh, and so the next set, this cycle three, was just announced. So uh, on February 29th, this organization outlined the 253 programs that will use our um, a telescope here, the Webb Space Telescope, for a collective of 5,500 hours between July 2024 and June 2025, again known as Cycle 3. Some of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope's uh, first-year targets include studying potential exomoons, or moons that surround uh, other planets. Uh, so far, exomoons have proved proved an elusive subject for astronomers because they're hunted using the same light blocking techniques uh, or employed to spot exoplanets around stars, but this technique is difficult enough as it is to find planets, let alone even smaller objects like moons. Um, I wonder if this is a, a better picture. I don't know. It's just uh, <laughs> trying to find something dynamic uh, to put in the background, but I'll just switch back to my normal background as I'm talking about this. So Webb's going to be studying some exomoons, moons from exoplanets. Of course, exoplanets themselves uh, will be a part of this uh, next set of uh, explorations and missions and uh, uh, studies. And we're going to be looking at the atmospheres of these exoplanets, uh, and um, we're going to be looking at habitability of exoplanets as well, whether or not they could support life. We're going to be studying supermassive black holes and even distant galaxies that existed during the dawn of time. Uh, astronomers widely believe that the majority of our universe's large galaxies have supermassive black holes in their hearts. Uh, and so by studying these distant supermassive black holes, uh, we're able to learn more about the formation of these ancient galaxies. And uh, scientists hope to understand how these black holes may have actually influenced the growth of these galaxies. Perhaps they are part of uh, what's to blame for these massive galaxies existing so early on in our universe. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is also going to be studying large-scale structures of the cosmos, revealing hopefully more information about mysteries like dark energy uh, and uh, the forces that drive these things. Um, so uh, this is just the tip of the celestial iceberg, of course, uh, between 2024 and 2025. Astronomers will also train the telescope on distant stars to better understand stellar physics and populations, as well as examining the gas that exists between stars uh, that can become the building blocks of future stars and planets. Now, Webb uh, was designed to study distant objects in mind, but during cycle three, we'll also be looking at uh, planets and other bodies in our solar system. For example, we're going to be looking at the source of gas plumes coming from Saturn's moon Enceladus, one of my personal favorite moons that has an ocean of liquid water below its surface. It'll be exploring Uranus's rings as well and categorizing other icy, categorizing other icy objects that exist in the Kuiper belt at the very edge of our solar system. Looking beyond Cycle 3, the call for Cycle 4 proposals is already going to be out. Uh, that will start on August 1st this year, and the deadline is set for October 16th. So if you want to use Web, start writing those proposals now. Uh, and the Cycle 4 Telescope Allocation Committee will review the run uh, between February 3rd and 12th of next year, and the selections will be, will be revealed around March in 2025. And those observations will start in July of 2025 as well. So again, as I was mentioning before, Webb is designed for a mission of at least five years with a goal of 10, but we are optimistic that it'll last even longer thanks to a very efficient launch and deployment. So hopefully Webb will continue wowing us for many years to come. And I hope you all will continue to be an amazed and inspired by space, astronomy, and all of this amazing science. 
uh, for many years to come, even as these live streams start to come to a conclusion. And for that, we are going to head back to our comments as we start to wrap up tonight's show. Jerry in the comments says, what a great presentation. Thanks so much. Very informative. Thanks again for watching tonight, Jerry. And let me know if you stop by the planetarium sometime for sure. Carrie is saying, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. My family has really enjoyed watching these videos together. And uh, I have enjoyed you watching along with us as well, Carrie. And Phoebe has enjoyed it too. Phoebe, that was possibly the almost the best seemingly scripted entrance you could have made to these live streams. Hi, Phoebe. Phoebe wants to say hello as well. Uh, oh, and making a special cameo appearance is my first live stream man bun. So enjoy that, everybody. Sorry, Granny. All right, so we are wrapping up tonight's stream. Phoebe is very excited. This was our 99th live stream. Thank you to our 350 views uh, over the past four years. And we have one more stream to go. That will be our 100th live stream on April 1st. Rhonda in the comments is excited for Phoebe. And Phoebe's excited to see you too, Rhonda. Phoebe, scratch indeed. And Katie has a question. All right, Katie, I'm ready for the question. And I'm going to continue vamping. And uh, letting Phoebe just talk. Phoebe? Scratch? No more scratch. Oh, tweet. Scratch. Phoebe? Can you give me kisses? Give me kisses. I'm not going to do it. Oh, tweet. All right. Katie's question is, who's in charge of the lasers for the music laser shows? Yeah, so our evening laser shows and daytime laser shows sometimes. Uh, those shows are created uh, by an amazing group called laser fantasy um they have uh, actually built all of our laser projectors as well and they create our amazing shows uh so if you have any requests let me know because i can pass those along i unfortunately don't have time to make my own laser shows i'm doing enough as it is um but uh, our laser fantasy laser shows are amazing jerry says bye thanks see you next month see you next month in april april 1st for our 100th live stream uh, thank you so much again, everyone, for watching. This has been Phoebe chewing on my shirt, and I have been Patrick Hess, Planetary Manager. Be sure to head over to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium on Facebook. Like and subscribe to us there to make sure you don't miss all of the exciting space updates coming up in the future. Head over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium, where you can subscribe to us there and catch recordings of all of our other 98 previous streams curated in playlists for you. And our last comment looks like for today is Tammy saying, thank you so much, Patrick. We've always enjoyed these live streams and we'll see you next time for the last one. And I will see you all on April 1st. Thank you so much for watching everybody. Katie says we love those music shows and we love doing the laser shows too. Those will for sure continue. So stay tuned again. Laser Movie Magic has some amazing songs coming up for Spring Break and, of course, Laser Taylor Swift. Tickets are starting to sell out for those, so be sure to grab your Laser Taylor Swift tickets as soon as possible. But before this bird poops on my shoulder, I am going to start signing off. So thank you all so much for watching. We will see you all again next time, and I will see you in April for our 100th live stream. Say bye, Phoebe. Scratch. That's right. Bye, everyone.